finger? No. Granola bar munchers? And be entertained. So today we're going to talk about to be or not to be. That's the question. Come on in. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to say that the forum in Los Alamos, our church is once a month, usually on the second Sunday of the month. But because this is such a timely topic that um, the forum committee actually created us extra forum time for me to give this talk. So I want to thank Evan and their forum committees for squeezing me in this morning. So, BCD Los Alamos, I have a fear of public speaking, but this kind of slides is designed so well that I can just let it run and you can read it, right? So anyway, what is the BCD Los Alamos about? Let me show you the next slide. <clears throat> What's obesity? Well, obesity is a pollinator-friendly community. And obesity is an affiliate of the Obesity USA, which is a program, a nationwide program, that recognizes, supports, and encourages pollinator conservation in cities, towns, and counties, and also in campuses. So if you have university campus, you can become a BCD campus. <clears throat> So the organization that uh, puts out this program is called CERCES Cer Society. It's X-E-R-C-E-S. And it's kind of like Audubon Society. Audubon Society is for conservation of birds, but CERCES Society is for conservation of invertebrates that include pollinators. So what are the steps for Los Alamos County to become a bee city? You know that Los Alamos County is a, the entire county is a wildlife uh, habitat. And the certification for that, according to the group that gives out the certification, is a certain number of households become wildlife, um, certified wildlife habitat and then peak went ahead and did the certification for the whole county. So if you go into peak, at the entrance, you'll see a wildlife certification for the entire county. But that doesn't work the same way with B-City. So for B-City to become, for Los Alamos County to become a B-City, we first of all have to limit the harmful pesticide and herbicide use, which we have done. The county has voted, I think last year, early, more than a year ago, to limit the use of harmful pesticides and herbicides for county land. Of course, we cannot go to every household and say, no, you can't use this. But we have made it a point not to use it in county land. If you go to Ashley Pond Park, you can see the grass are green. But if you look carefully, you can see clovers. You can see dandelions. There are all kinds of wildflowers. And I practice Tai Chi with my group there, and I do um, barefoot. And I have to be very careful not to step on a bee. There were bees and butterflies really down there. So take a look and, and, and notice that our county has gone ahead and thanks to all the county council who voted for it. So the next thing we wanted to do is to form a committee comprising of very specific representations of stakeholders and expertise. And this we have done. Now we're going to create a BCD Los Alamos website. We started to do this. And this website is going to be linked from PEAK. So we gave the PEAK webmaster all the information that was needed to develop a, a link to a BCD website from PEAK. So all we need to do is have him or her or they uh, create this site for us, and we will satisfy the next. All right. Educational outreach is an ongoing thing, and this is one of them. We have a B-City Facebook group, a B-City email list, and we participated in Earth Day, Science Fest, and we are giving talks like that to different groups of people. You know, if you have a group of people who are interested in receiving such a presentation, contact me, and I, one of our committee members will do the presentation for you. The more we reach out, the more people are aware of what we're doing. 
the better chance we have of becoming a bee city before the end of this year. That's my goal. All right, have an integrated pest management IPM plan, and we already done that. In fact, the county has a very detailed one. It's 10 pages long, where, where they talk about how to get rid of unwanted species in our county land. So the final, not quite the final thing, but the county council needs to vote on the BCD resolution. And the committee has sat down and written the resolution, and it's two pages long, and we have sent it to our liaison to the county. And the first thing they need to do is to have the lawyer go through every single word, make sure it's okay, and then the, the, give it to the county council, and they will post online at least 15 days before they can vote on it, so the public get to read it. And then they will have a hearing, and they may have, a have one of us give a presentation during the, before they vote on it. But I'm quite sure, given our county council has been very supportive of the first item, then I'm very sure that they will be very supportive of this. So finally, after the county council has voted to approve this resolution, then we need to submit the applications to Circus Society. And the application is just filled in a form, and then we pay an annual due. I think it, is, it depends on the size of the city. So uh, according to our size, it's probably $200 a year. Now, with the wildlife certification, you pay a $75 for a sign, and you're done. You can have the sign forever until you break down, and you may have to pay for another sign. But for the B-City uh, status, once we become a B-City, we have to make an annual report about a year, usually in February, listing what we have done in the previous years and to satisfy the continuation of our status. And we also have to pay a $200 fee every year. So it is a thing that you know, we have to keep doing, not just once and it's done. Next. So our committee consists of all these people. Christine O'Hara is the program director of uh, PEAK. We needed to have collaboration between a nature uh, group, which PEAK satisfied, and the government, the county government. And we are very happy to have Corey Styron. He is the Los Alamos Community Services Director. And he is on board with us. And having these two big guns on board with us is really something to our advantage. And we also have um, Craig Martin, who is a native plant specialist. Jenna Stanek is a leno ecologist, so we also have an arm out in the leno direction, so all the stakeholders are there. So the rest of us, Dana is a landscaper and she's a native plant specialist. Ruth Doy is a landscape architect and a master gardener. And finally, you know where I am and who I am. Okay, what is a pollinator? They're all, the first one lists all the different ones. These are, except for the bats, they are invertebrates. So they move pollen from plant to plant, ensuring the fertilization and reproduction. So honeybee do pollinate, but they are not native to New Mexico. They are uh, introduced from Europe. They are not threatened, and research has shown that they compete with native pollinators for resources. So in my uh, write-up in The Voice, I said, in order to Quote, save the bee by raising honeybee is kind of like saving bald eagle by raising chickens. Because one is domesticated, the other is, is, is wild. It's the kind of comparison. Oh, this, this graph is amazing. I don't know how many hours of research goes into it. If it I can look at this every day and learn something new from it. So, there's, let me see if there's a, a pointer, but you can see the very tiny yellow strip on the top, the very tiny strips are all the bumblebees and, and honeybees together. That's how, much, how many species they are. But the rest of them, the rest of them are different kinds of native bees. The biggest one 
is the one on the left, which is called, and I don't even know how to pronounce this, Andrina Dei. And the one on the right is Api Dei. Well, in the Spanish word for um, B is Api. And then there's a very, so if you look at the writing along the outside, you see one, two, three, four, five families of bees. Actually, there are six. The sixth one is that tiny little purple one between the orange and the blue. And if you follow that line, it goes to that little bee over there. Out of that, the, the top left-hand one. So for each, each bee um, group, they tell you how many species they have found and um, what kind of habitats they have. Very tiny letter. So bumblebees are important, and there are more than 4,000 species of native bee in the United States. We'll need both of them for our pollination because uh, honeybees are trucked across the country to pollinate uh, monoculture like almond groves and, you know, raspberry fields or whatever, they, 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 they really, we need them together, but they are not endangered. So more than 75, 70% of solitary ground bees, they are nesting in stems or, or under the ground. So why is New Mexico a hotspot for native pollinators? Out of the 4,000, we actually have more than 1,000 uh, species in our state alone. And the reason is, if you observe the bees, when it's wet and cold, they don't do much. They sleep or they, they're cold. They don't, they're very, not very active. But when it's dry and sunny, ooh, they're out there doing all that work. So New Mexico is unique because we have this, so the desert between, between our state and Mexico. Um, the name of the desert I was going to Chihuahua Desert, Chihuahua. Chihuahua Desert. And that's one of the hotspots. The other hotspot is the Sonora Desert, uh, a little bit northeast of us, northwest of us. So, why are pollinators so important? Of course, they are responsible for 85% of all food. The native pollinators ensure that native plants reproduce. There are certain native bees that only, only visit one native plant. And if that native plant is not available, the bee will die. Okay, so <clears throat> some of the native plants are, are also endangered. If we don't have the bees to pollinate those native plants, then the plants and the bees both have, are in danger of extinction. So also our native pollinator is part of the food chain. Of course, you know, there is, is, yeah, they, they are food for the birds, reptiles, and mammals. Oh, this, this is just really tears me up when I look at it. How many percentage of all the invertebrates have become extinct? So when Mike and I first came to this country in 1976, 70, 72, before we have children, we travel around the country, you know, in our little Ford Falcon. And um, at the end of the day, you see all these this dead insects on the windscreen. Do you see this anymore? You, you still do, all across the country, but not so much. Do you remember the story called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? So in there, there's a character. He has a superpower, and he would just wipe his hand across the windshield, and all the dead animals come back to life and flow. That was really, really touching. You know, I wish I had that kind of superpower. So look at the first one. How many percent has gone extinct? That, that, that invertebrate is what fishermen used to use for fishing. You don't see them anymore hardly. You know, they, are, they are actually like, like um, mosquito. They, they um, have to have water to finish their life cycle. So butterflies, more than 50%. Bees, almost 50% have gone extinct. So all these are the problems that causes the decline of these invertebrate pollinators. Okay, so what can we do? We can educate and increase awareness around 
So like New Mexico has already two B cities, which is Santa Fe and Albuquerque. We are the third one to apply. And around the country, we have, uh, you know, not a lot, but a couple of hundred communities. So all these are the stuff that we would like to do. <clears throat> you, we can do, um, we are in the, at the moment in the process of applying for a grant for uh, conservation. And if you get it, it's $100,000. And we can afford to give away plants. We can afford to help people in Los Alamos to, to get pollinator-friendly gardens going in their backyard, front yard, whatever. I'm really excited about that. And the deadline for that application is October 1st. So give me a, put a fire under my seat. Huh? OK. <clears throat> we, we have to annually update the integrated pest management documents and see where we go from there. We have to increase the availability of native flowering species. So you have, instead of planting, um, stuff that uh, are specially raised to please humans, and some of them are such that they don't even have pollens and they don't even have nectar, or they are in such a way that the insects cannot get to it. So native plants, okay, we also work with open space. If you have you know, native seeds, when you go for a walk, just gather them for open space, but make sure they are not invasive species. That's why we have some of those um, nat um, native plant specialists in our group, so that he can tell us, no, you can't scatter these seeds because they will be invasive. Uh, you, did you know that um, Bronca Mesa Elementary has a pollinator gardens? In fact, we have a pollinator garden. I just put a sign there a few months ago. So, let you look at that for a few minutes. Okay, I just want you to enjoy that picture of mostly native plants. Instead of grass and lawn, isn't that nice? And once they are established, you don't really need to water them if they are native. Okay, some of the concerns that we heard from people is, any time of bee stings. So the one thing I want to point out is most of the bee stings come from honeybee. You know, bumblebee is very, are very friendly. They don't sting you. They are very, you know, and if they do sting you, the stings are not as bad. In fact, uh, last month, my granddaughter was playing with two honeybee in her hand like this, and they both stung her. And I said, why would they, are you threatening them? They, you know, she said, no, they were just there. And then all of a sudden, and she just put some, you know, baking powder solution and it was gone very quickly. And um, have you ever played with a bumblebee? If you see a bumblebee on your flower and, you know, you go near it and you can see the bumblebee put out one, one, one leg. It's like, hello. I don't know what he's trying to say, but it's communicating with you. It's saying, you know, I can feel your heat. I know you're here. I'm here. You know, so you can play with bumblebee without harming them. So my friend, um, a couple of days ago, we went to um, a tour of the Peak Garden raised beds, and it's full of pollinators. And the woman who takes care of, her, of it, Natalie, and she's over 90 years old. I think she's 94, and she still takes care of those gardens. And she's highly allergic to bees, but she has never got stung because she leaves them alone. You know, if you don't, don't threaten them, they are okay. And uh, I remember a few years ago, we had this um, uh, sunflower garden out there. We, we grow sunflower in a ring, and we put, um, we put you know, little, little things for children to sit down, and I taught the children about bee safety. So... The Ari children, we ask them to come in to this area and you can hear the bees all around you. And I said, just don't move. Just enjoy them. You don't, don't want to suddenly act, you know, like you're threatened. If they're threatened, then they might sting you. But 
they, they like it. They say, yeah, you don't, ha you don't have to be scared of bees. Okay, fire hazards. So most of the plants that you grow, like native plants, they die down in the fall, and then they have all these stalks. They're not very pretty to look at, but those are very important nesting for, for bees and other pollinators. And if you think it you can mow them to a certain land, not all, not all the way down, so that will reduce the fire hazards. So maintenance, but when you first planted native plants, you have to water them, unless you plant it in the, in the rainy seasons, the monsoon, and unless you can rely on the monsoon. This year, we couldn't rely on the monsoon. So I started in May, a small plot just in the demo garden, and um, it was full of gravel, and underneath about that much gravel, there was a, a landscape cloth. So I dug into the gravel, cut into the landscape cloth, and plunged in uh, small groups of flower that are uh, native flower that are dug out from my backyard, so I don't have to buy any plants. But I have to water them every other day. Until maybe last week or so, now they're well established, I can water them once a week. But the first two years, you have to take good care of them. But after that, let nature do the watering. You can heavily mulch them um, so to keep the water in. All right, aesthetic. Well, we have to re-educate ourselves as to what looks pretty. Flat mold grass doesn't look pretty to me. You know, wild-looking stuff looks really pretty. Okay, so the energy and water, water conservation is one part of growing native plants. They don't need that much water compared to non-natives. So you conserve the, the species. They are better adapted to local climate, climate and um, main, maintenance is not as much as with uh, non-native plants. And they are gradually become, you know, more adaptive and resilient to our, our, play, our, our climate. And this, the, the, the grand opportunity is really a big kick. Okay, here's one way in which the water from the road can be directed down into a, a pollinator garden. So we got this nice picture for you to enjoy. Okay, we have a, a lot of partners in our work. The Peak and V City Los Amos Committee, I talked about that. The National Laboratory, Master Gardeners Programs, New Mexico Native Plant Society. This is just a flow chart because we couldn't fit it in. It doesn't really have to go in that direction. So we, we are gonna gradually work through each of these and uh, reach out to everybody who are interested and be, become part of the B City initiative. Okay, what can we do to help? We, I mentioned that again before. Don't use those harmful pesticides. If you can convert your lawn, lawn to pollinator garden one square foot at a time, <laughs> you don't have to do the whole lawn. You know, go a little bit at a time. <clears throat> so talk to your friends and family, especially children, why we are doing this. And leaf blower is another thing that we, if you blow away the leaf, you expose the soil, you blow away all the, there may be aches and stuff underneath the leaf, leaf pile, and they get destroyed. And wh when you get bare soil, what happens? Soil erosion, they just blow away. And uh, so keep leaves, uh, we, we do what's called chop and drop in my garden. Whenever I prune anything, I just drop, let it, this is how um, na nature does it, mother nature does it. The trees fall their leaf and the leaf soil and just let them stay there over the winter. So do a spring cleanup. In fact, in the Chinese calendar, which is a lunar cal calendar, we have a day called the day of awakening for insects. And that's the day that you get to start cleaning up. Before that, the insects are still needing all that space. 
<clears throat> There's a, a program called No Mow May. In the month of May, don't mow anything. Just because this is early part of the spring, and there's not a lot of other flowers around, so if your lawn has uh, dandelions and other uh, clover, great, just let them stay there so that you have pollinators coming to feed the pollinator. Become a gorilla gardener. Does anybody know what a gorilla gardener is? Yeah, yes. We actually did that, uh, I think, three years ago, four years ago, after Blue Window moved out, their wisteria was all over, and people couldn't go around the corner where the traffic is because they cannot see all this wisteria. So I got together about 12 people. I think, Nancy, you were one of them. Oh. We spent a Labor Day weekend cutting down this wisteria and uh, put away like uh, two trucks full of leaves and stuff to clear the space. So gorilla gardeners are the, the gardeners who are rebels. They do things around to make sure, you know, that it started in, in, in cities where there are food, we call it food desert. People can't get any fresh food. All they can get is 7-Eleven. In order to get fresh food in a big city, they have to go on a bus for hours before they reach. So gorilla gardeners will take over county land in that area and start growing food for us so that the local people can have some fresh food. Um, so we, we are Gorilla Garden, and I'm proud to be one. So I, we have talked to the Parks and Recs board and said, can we, we were giving out wildflower seeds at the uh, Earth Day, and, and I said to people, you know, you have a little bit of county land outside your fence. Just scatter this in and let them, let Mother Nature take care of them. And they said, but then the county will come and mow it. You know, our efforts will be gone. So we talked to the Parks and Rec. We're going to institute a program, hopefully, that we actually adopt a piece of county land and we are responsive for, responsible for it. And if they have the money or we, we, can, we can make signs that say, uh, do not mow, pollinate a garden, and you can even put the county sign on it so the county workers know it is part of their efforts. It's not just, you know, random. So the last thing we can do is come to the county council meeting when they are ready to vote on obesity. Whoops. That's now, do you have any question for me? Yes, Bob. Has anybody done all the testing by staff? The question is what the city... Okay, the question is, does anybody in town have beehives set up? We looked into it, and we don't know anybody in Los Alamos, but apparently there are people, what, at least one person in White Rock who has a beehive. Yes. Who? In Los Alamos. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there are. There are some in Western area, too. And where? Okay, so one of my friends, Dorothy, used to be a beekeeper, but she moved out of town. And when I asked her about what they are in Los Amas, she didn't give me any of this, but she mentioned something in White Rock. Anyway, I'm glad to know you have, you have looked into it, too. All right, other question? Yes. So you may not know from your council story, but how can you start Okay, before the county council votes, they will put out their county council agenda every, you know, they usually do it on the Tuesday. And I think you know more about this, right, Felicia? Yeah. Um, actually, maybe, would you be willing to share uh, through an email to your email address how you got the announcement? Sure, yeah, I will, I will put an announcement, the U UU announcement list, when I know the county council vote coming up. But uh, I also have an email list for B-City. If you want to join it, we have now about more than 100 people on it. It's a, it's a Google group, yes. So the question about B-City, it's a little strange that a city like Albuquerque is one of the first ones in the national press to make a comment on B-City. So what is the difference between the two? I, I would think that it's typically smaller cities. Some of them
So why is it makes Albuquerque th that doesn't seem to fit the profile of a B city because it's so large and, and it's so many people? Maybe there's a small section of it, not the entire city. It could be a, a region. You can have a B campus. So um, maybe the University of New Mexico in, um, in uh, where's that place called? Um, Oh, Eastern New Mexico, they can become a B city if they want to apply. So it also depends on whether you have a group of people willing to do that. So entirely, it's very hard to have a suburb. I, I mean, the city, become, you know, a very crowded city become a B city. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, it's strange. But maybe towers will be the next. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, uh, Okay, so if you know where there are beehives, can you send me the location approximately, and I'll send it out to you, you Los Alamos announcement list. Yes? I'm, I'm very confused. Are we talking about beehives for European honey? Yes, beehives are, met, are to keep people who keep the honey bee for, for the um, honey. Some of them are social. Let me see. Um, in that big, huge chart, it, it tells you which species are social and which species are solitary. A lot are solitary ones. They're just the queens over winter in the ground. And she comes up um, in the spring and start building nests for her babies. And then she, she would uh, put an egg in each one and uh, put pollen and just they'll raise like that, so solitary bees. Um, yeah, uh, honey bees are the ones that are not in danger, yes? So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too complicated, but I used to be a uh, beekeeper at that hive um, until I learned to get rid of honeybees. Um, yes. They're actually they're, they're fighting oh. the bees. Yeah. So I'm not into that. Well, <laughs> they, they do compete for the you know, the flowers, the, the nectars and pollens and stuff like that, yes. Have you seen them actually fighting? No. no? Yeah, but it just, just that there are more of the honeybees than um, native bees. But the native bees, you know, when I looked at my um, pollinator garden, a lot of that native bees are mostly what you see are bumblebees, but they are tiny ones that's about the size of fleas. And, you know, they, they are there. You, you just don't, you know... Be able to capture them, yes. Could you tell me order bees that are native bees? I don't know that, but I'll. Uh, okay, so people have been talking about bee hotel rather than beehive. Uh, they are commercially made bee hotels with tubes that you can buy, and hopefully, it's just like trying to feed the hummingbirds with hummingbird feeder. You buy a bee hotel and set it up and hopefully the bees will come. The problem with that is that you, you, you need to know how to keep it clean so that it doesn't spread infections, just like hummingbird feeder. I started hummingbird feeders and people, somebody told me, your hummingbird feeder is dirty. You're going to clean it or the, you'll kill the hummingbird. So now I stopped feeding hummingbird. I just grow the flowers for them. So the best way to encourage native bees is to grow the native flowers and do all the stuff that we talk about. Yeah. Yes, Janet. So you know, try and play with it next time. <laughs> so move, move your hand close. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those are th those are nat natural hotels for them. It's kind of yeah. I've seen picture of it. It's kind of uh, made with uh, tubes that face with holes. And they're all different size holes and different depths. And each size, different depths uh, attract different kinds of bees. So you can have bees, you know, together. I've actually used one or seen one in real life. I just seen a picture of it. 
And some people make their own. If you have a tree trunk, um, you can drill holes, but make them face east. That's where the sun comes in. That's where the bees usually go in and out, facing east, and at a certain level. It's just like putting out bird feeder at a certain level to attract certain kinds of birds and so on. Yeah, there's very, some specifics like that. All right? So, anything else? Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.